Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome back to our series of lectures on the history of Western thought, why we think the way we do. It's good to see all of you back uh, this week. Last week, since we ended with Nietzsche, I was afraid some of you would go home too depressed to come back. But it's good that you could be here today. Um, I'm starting and ending each of the talks with this slide because it tells you where you can find. If you miss any of the lectures or you want to recommend them to someone else, this is where you can find them under www.liteachapala.org and then there's a, there are a series of tabs across a bar at the top and this is under the 8 week lectures tab and you will find the lectures and also the powerpoints are available to see. So again, if you miss one, if you want to recommend to somebody, or if you just have to listen to one of them again, then you can go there to, to find it, all right? We're getting close to our end here. Today is the last day I'm going to talk about a specific theme and lecture next week. We, we are going to deal with where we go from here. So far we've, we've talked about the philosophers that dealt with issues of faith, reason, experience, process, will. Today we're going to talk about meaning and meaninglessness which probably more than anything else represents the modern approach to philosophy and I think more directly than any of the things we've talked about are the fundamental planks of kind of the Western psyche, the Western uh, ethos or understanding of what it means to, to live in our culture, how we think, how we understand things. Um, this ever-growing list is the various philosophers that we talked about. Again, if you're interested in this stuff, it is available online with, along with the videos. Um, generally speaking, I have proposed that there are two ways, two predominant ways, that philosophy, since the very earliest Greek philosophers, philosophers in the West, again, as I said from the start, I'm not dealing with Eastern philosophy, that's a very different creature, but in terms of our Western culture, most philosophy has either been founded in a basic belief in idealism, which means that reality is something we know with our minds. Either we understand it a priori before any input, or it's something that our minds create. Or else we understand reality uh, as materialism, meaning it is entirely a matter of what we gain from our senses, how we experience the external world. So um, the list that I have here are the philosophers, certainly not all of the philosophers. We'd be here a lot longer than, than seven or eight weeks if we are going to do that. But in terms of idealism, believing that reality is what occurs in our minds, we've talked about Plato, St. Augustine, René Descartes, Immanuel Kant, Friedrich Schleiermacher, George W.F. Hegel, which W.F. stands for, you remember? Wilhelm Friedrich. During that period of time, almost every German philosopher, almost every German man, was named either Wilhelm or Friedrich, or Wilhelm Friedrich or Friedrich Wilhelm. So, George Hegel, um, Alfred North Whitehead, we're getting into the 20th century there now, and then on the materialist side, Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, John Locke, to a great extent David Hume, then down to Charles Darwin and his uh, materialism and scientism, and Karl Marx, okay? This is not exact, but generally speaking, people have fallen into either an idea, a camp of idealism or a camp of materialism. Now, in the process of these various thinkers, one of the premises of this whole series of lectures is that most people assume that how they look at the world, the things that they assume to be true in the world, are just common sense. Everybody thinks this, everybody has always thought this, or at least once they got their heads together they thought this, without realizing that many of the principles of how people think today in our Western culture were simply invented by somebody. Somebody came up with this stuff. Now granted, in, in virtually every case, they came up with it as a way to try to explain how we perceive reality, how we understand reality, but still, the particulars of these things were invented by people. And it is not something that we should ever be able to take for granted that this is just common sense. This We need to understand the sources of this stuff so that we can make critical judgments about what we think is true and what we think is not. If we don't have any background in that, then all of this stuff just sort of washes over us and we end up being blown along with the path of you know, it's the path of least resistance in terms of what our culture thinks. G.K. Chesterton, one of my great heroes in the world, said, any dead thing can go with the current, only a living thing can go against it. So I'm proposing that we all need to be more living things. We need to be prepared in understanding where some of these concepts came from, what we believe, whether we agree or disagree, so that we can go against the current when we think that that's appropriate and necessary. All right? And not just get blown along. 
some of the different ideas that we've, I'm going to stick all these up here, that we've talked about um, in terms of the isms. These are ways of viewing the world. We talked about subjectivism and rationalism. I've added these two together because they're always like subjectivism means it's all about me, it's what I think and experience or prefer. And rationalism is that rationality, the mind, is the only source of truth. When people say, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me, that's the ultimate subjectivism. What I think determines reality. Really? Do we think that's true? Reality is entirely what I think or prefer? And is it entirely a matter of what my mind says? Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. What about what I feel? What about what I experience? Is it just rationality, rationalism in this case, or is there something else to our perception of reality? Scientism, which we're going to talk about some today because we get into that directly, science and empirical observation are the only sources of truth. Science is the only way you can know what is truth, which if you carry that, scientism carries that to the point of saying that religion, metaphysics, the belief in the supernatural, none of that has any validity at all. It's all just made up stuff and you need to get rid of it. That's what scientism says. Science. Empirical data is the only thing that is a source of truth. Skepticism, how can we know for sure about anything? David Hume was the great champion of that. We can thank him for that. He used to be one of my heroes, and now I go, David, David, David. Because he has infected so much. Descartes started it because he started with this experiment of doubting everything except his own rationality. And then Hume, relativism, the idea that truth is not absolute, it varies with, it varies with different experiences. This goes back to subjectivism somewhat. Hume, Kant, Schleiermacher, Whitehead all said it is how you process things that creates your reality. And therefore there is no absolute reality. How I process and what I perceive may be fundamentally different than yours. And so your reality and my reality might be different. Well, what are the consequences of believing there is no such thing as objective reality? That it, there is a reality beyond what I think about it, or even whether I'm in the room. If a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, does it make a noise? That's a relativistic question. The idea of if no sensory perception of an event occurs, is it even real? The very fact that we ask that question advocates for relativism. Experience determines reality. All right, then humanism. Humanism says that truth is found in humans and in human science rather than the revelation from any supernatural source. There is no God or any supernatural. Now, humanism can also refer in the social sciences to simply a valuing of humanity. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about believing that truth is found in us, not from anything outside of us. Hegel, Darwin, Marx, Whitehead, James, William James, Nietzsche, all of them and more uh, supported that. Pragmatism. If it works, it must be right and true. As Gordon Gekko said in Wall Street, greed is good. Why? Because greed works. <laughs> if it feels good, do it, was the sort of sexual revolution expression of that. If it feels good, do it, is just a sensual expression of if it works, it must be right and true. Machiavelli advocated that in The Prince. William James, in his pragmatism, his philosophical system of pragmatism, along with C.S. Uh, Pierce, Charles Sanders Pierce, they, the, the two of them developed pragmatism as a philosophical belief. Pragmatism is what it sounds like. If it works, it must be right. And then nihilism. Nihilism says God is dead. More than that, that nothing has meaning and that strength is what rules. Not right. If, if one party, if one person has the strength to control, then they have the right to do it. Okay? Nietzsche advocated that earlier, Machiavelli, in The Prince, but Nietzsche was the primary advocate in his declaration that we should all seek to be the supermen or ubermensch, which are beyond any belief in mor no, no morality, the slave morality that tries to control us, is we need to cast it off and be bigger than that and do what we believe we want. Yes, Larry. Uh, you mentioned last week that I was saying that one of these two guys was insane. Nietzsche. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, at least he's the only one that was technically ruled insane. <laughs> he was, um, and if you read him a lot, you might join him. Uh, the Nietzsche is very difficult. He spent the last 10 years of his life in the insane asylum, and he died fairly young. You know, he wasn't an old man when he died. But uh, he was brilliant. His, 
so much so that he was named a full professor at Tübingen University, uh, a philosophy professor when he was 24 years old. That does not happen. It certainly didn't happen when Nietzsche was a young man. So his brilliance was unquestioned. And he was an extraordinary poet. You know, he was, during his early life, he was better known as a poet than he was a philosopher. So anyway, some extraordinary people in this list, and we don't doubt their intelligence, but we doubt how they applied that in some cases. All right, any questions about any of the rest of those? Yes, Walt. Uh, after listening last week and again now, what's kind of interesting is that you've got one guy, Nietzsche, who writes a book, who kind of didn't see. Uh, and all of society seems to swing over to him just like that, whether they've read him or not. It's just like, you know, that's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah, that everybody seems to go along with Well, obviously it begins in academia. Almost all of these people, one time or another, were professors, were teachers. But who doesn't want to be cool? Right? And, and when a philosopher like this comes along, and we're going to see this with Wittgenstein and with Derrida today, um, their beliefs became the cool new thing. Right? And um, there was a TV show once, and, the, and the, the hero was describing the bad guy, and he said, you know, he really only loves two things, money and blowing stuff up. That's a pretty good description of why a lot of these guys do philosophy, I think, is it's their job, you know, and it's not just money, but it's also uh, the, prestige. the prestige, the prominence that comes from that, you know, various of these people during their life, like Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, was considered the philosopher of his the first half of the 20th century, probably. I don't know, you may not have heard of Ludwig Wittgenstein, but you felt the effect um, of his work. But everybody wants to be cool, and these are the cool new philosophers. And Wittgenstein, for instance, I'm going to talk about him in a minute, uh, right now, but uh, he was horrifically rude to people. If they, like, he used to go to these, these intellectual clubs, like the Cambridge Debating Club, and they'd be talking about, and if he felt somebody simply wasn't able to get his ideas, he would turn his back to them and start reading poetry out loud as an expression of distaste for the fact they weren't smart enough. In fact, he never got a college degree, and yet his, uh, through the influence of friends who were professors at Cambridge and Oxford, especially Cambridge, they recommended that he submit his primary work, although he didn't have college education, for a dissertation, and they gave him a PhD. And when these two guys, Bertrand Russell and Fefta, two of the primary philosophers of their day, when they were seating, they were his jury. And you get a PhD, you have a jury. These experts were supposed to review your work and, and, and interview you and everything else. Before they sat down to do the interview for him, even though he didn't even have a college degree, he said, please don't worry, gentlemen, I know you're not capable of understanding my work, but do the best you can. <laughs> Bertrand Russell, you may have heard of Bertrand Russell. He was one of the foremost you know, experts in philosophy of mathematics, which is one of Luke, uh, Wittgenstein's areas of uh, work, ever. You know, he's written the text that he wrote, um, uh, Principia Mathematica, is still considered the fundamental document for philosophy of mathematics. But Wittgenstein said, oh, I know you can't understand my work. It's, you know, it's, it's way above you. But, so, blowing stuff up was part of the, what these guys liked, besides the prestige of it, okay? All right, let's get into the three philosophers, well, two philosophers in a philosophical school, because there are no living logical philosophers left, so I don't have a name associated with that, we'll talk about it. The first one I will look at is Ludwig Wittgenstein. Now, um, Wittgenstein, a fascinating individual, fascinating character. He was born in 1889, lived through two world wars, and interestingly, even after he became one of the foremost philosophers in the world, he served in the First World War, when he had already begun to name, make a name for himself, as a stretcher bearer in the First World War for the Astro-Hungarian military. He actually then ended up in battle. And he won a number of different uh, medals for bravery and medals of honor in the war. Now, he fought because he's Austrian and later became a British citizen. He's Austro-British, but he fought for the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the First World War. They were the bad guys. <laughs> They were the enemies of the U.S. and Britain and France and everything. They were part of the, of the Central Powers, along with Germany, okay? So he fought on that side, ended up spending some time in an Italian prison camp. Then in the Second World War, he ended up working as a medical assistant, delivering drugs from the pharmacy to people who, in medical hospitals and delivering the drugs to them. And they said that he always told people, don't take this. 
you know. <laughs> he thought he knew better than the doctors. So he would do the work, but at, at various times. He came from one of the wealthiest families in Europe. In fact, the Wittgenstein family, his father Carl Wittgenstein, was very rich. Second only to the Rothschild family in terms of wealth in all of Europe. So he never would have had to work a day in his life, but after his father died and he inherited an enormous fortune, he was the, the youngest of seven, uh, eight children, uh, he gave it all away and ended up going to work as an elementary school teacher in a small village in Austria. This was after he already had published his great work, which is the uh, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, which was his first great work. In fact, Wittgenstein's work is broken up in two halves. He published very early on, in 1921, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. And he had already gave a relay for himself before that, but they finally published it. And um, he believed that would provide the final solution to all philosophical problems. There's no question he was a genius. I mean, again, the smartest people of his day pretty much agreed that they weren't up to his level in terms of intellect. But then later on, he published a second work. It actually was published the year after he died, called uh, Philosophical Investigations. They collated a lot of his writings. And he took a, a rather different approach and disagreed with some of his earlier conclusions. But the primary thing about Wittgenstein, oh, by the way, I, I have to give you a little bit more of his history. He taught in this Austrian elementary school up in the mountains, a little village. And he got in trouble because in those days it was common for for a teacher, if the boys in, in school got answers wrong or didn't do their homework or whatever, to wrap their knuckles with a ruler or box their ears or whatever, well, he did that to the girls, too. And he got in big trouble. There was a big uh, uproar, and he had to leave, and later on he came back and apologized to the children and their families. And he would do these things. His first area of study, and he went to a technical school, was in um, aeronautics. He thought he was going to build airplanes. He had designs for airplanes. He actually patented a special kind of propeller. He then, because of all the math involved in that, he decided he'd like to study math. And he went to Cambridge and sort of forced himself on Bertrand Russell and others who at first were just really like Louis Cicero. <laughs> he ended up studying philosophy of math and then moved over into philosophy um, he's, uh, and, and philology, which is the study of words and their sources. He became one of the recognized authorities in half a dozen different kinds of philosophy. And he started out wanting to be an aeronautical engineer. Okay. Uh, an amazing guy. And very musical. His whole family was musical. Uh, he, the mathematics of music is one of the things that attracted him to, to math. But his ultimate key thought, the thing that Wittgenstein contributed, which has influenced us still to this day, is that language is the key to philosophy. It is not just thought, it is not sense experience, but rather it is language. He believed that all philosophical problems are a result of a misuse of language. Now the reason he says that is, philosophy is trying to deal with the nature of reality. And whether it's reality we perceive or reality, reality we conceive, whether it's out there or in here, materialism or idealism, it still is only reality when we express it. And how do human beings express the things we experience, either externally or internally? We do it in words. He said that in the same way that the, the experience of reality starts out very complex, and philosophy has always made the effort to try to simplify it, to break it down into the simplest kind of things so we can understand it better. He said that's a waste of time. We have to, only, we have to deal with the way we think about and, and, and refer to reality, which is the use of words. And so he said that language starts out with the, these very complex propositions in an effort to try to explain external reality. And our the job of the philosopher is to begin to break those down into the simplest possible, what he called atomic statements. And that the philosopher's job was to find a way to untangle language to simplify it, and in doing so, to simplify reality, and therefore solve, or he would say dissolve, just have to go away, the problems that they face. So language to Wittgenstein was the key. In fact, he said, apart from any understanding of the language and how that reflects philosophy and our understanding of reality, everything else is nonsense. To the point where he said, Language is only meaningful when it expresses a real and therefore scientific kind of truth. 
When you can say, you know, this is this long, or it's this color, or it's this loud, or whatever. He said, metaphysical or religious statements are not statements of fact. They are not statements that can be measured, and therefore the language associated with them is nonsensical. And should be done away with. You're going to hear this echo in the next two people, next two we're going to talk about. The quote that I have up here in the middle from him, and this is from his second uh, major work, The Philosophical um, Investigations, he said, philosophy is a battle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of language. Reminds me of uh, Mark Twain once said that the English and the Americans are two people separated by a common language. <laughs> well, that's very much what Wittgenstein was saying, is that it is language that messes us up. It bewitches us. It keeps us from seeing reality. And so the job of the philosopher is to simplify the language we use, focus on that, and make it as, as these atomic propositions, the simplest, and therefore we will solve or dissolve the philosophical problems. Um, he challenged the idea of rationality being the focus of philosophy, or that experience and will gave us the core value. He said, it doesn't matter what's real, it matters what you say, what your language is, because that's what reflects what your mind is doing. And it's, it's accepted that people cannot, you know, we, when we think about something, unless you suffer from a very rare condition, there are a couple of examples of that. Uh, there are kinds of autism where uh, people don't deal in words, they don't think in words, they think in images more. But that's very rare, almost every human being will think in words. That's how we think, that's how our mind processes stuff, and that's why Wittgenstein said what he did. He says that language gives us word pictures, and that those word pictures are what actually constitute reality. And the only word pictures that are meaningful are those that represent facts, propositions of science, as I said before, and that metaphysics and ethical statements simply don't have any meaning. They're nonsense. Now, you can hear exactly that expression coming out of Charles Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and the various other people, most recently, who represent the New Atheists. That to say, make a statement about God or the supernatural or the non-physical, is nonsense. It's meaningless. It doesn't. And so, there are very specific ways in which you know the new atheists reflect one one way in which Wittgenstein has influenced modern thinking. You can't accept God because no statements about God have any meaning. They're not scientific. They therefore are nonsense, and it's silly to talk about them. Now, Wittgenstein said the meaning of a word and what the word represents is in how you use it. And so, therefore, it's the relationship between various words that make reality happen. Now, he had a tremendous influence, the logical po positives that we're going to talk about, the, the whole philosophy of language. In fact, if you go into philosophy in any university to study philosophy, to do a doctorate in philosophy, a significant part of what you will do will be philosophy of language. Because even if you're studying philosophy of science, or epistemology, how we know things, or ontology, the nature of existence, uh, a huge part of that today is going to be one of the words we use related to it. And Wittgenstein is the one that really launched all of that. Um, all, as I say here at the bottom, starting with his influence, almost all philosophy today is at least somewhat an exercise in philosophy of language. Everything has been influenced by him. All right? Now, um, any questions about that so far? To sort of see where he's coming from. I'm curious why we've never heard of them. We've heard of all those other people. What do you read? <laughs> it's, it, 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 Wittgenstein is considered one of the primary philosophers of the first, first half of the 20th century. A lot of it is that, you know, what you get into. He, um, his stuff, I just told you that two of the primary philosophers of mathematics, uh, the logic of mathematics, he said, well, don't worry about it, gentlemen, you're not going to understand my work anyway. It's unlikely you would ever be asked to sit down and read Wittgenstein. Now, his first book is only 75 pages, but what is 75 pages? I put it right up there next to Kierkegaard's uh, um, oh, Suffering of the Death, is that what it is? Um, that's the wrong title, Something of the Death, as being almost impossible. I, I, I think I said this in this course before, if you can read the first page of Kierkegaard's Suffering unto death, that's the kind. 
can't I remember this. It's um, the scripture the way you read it. Well, if you can read the first page and tell me seriously that you understand it, I will give you a thousand dollars. I read that first page a hundred times before I had any sense of what it meant. That's how I was reading a manual of Kant's no oh, physics of uh, Kant, yeah, or oh. Hegel. Hegel's even worse, you know. Um, so these, these guys aren't easy. And for the most part, it's because they do think at a level most of us don't get to. Um, but Wittgenstein was so, you know, he was so convinced that he understood the whole meaning, and he was going to solve all the problems of philosophy. And a lot of people thought that he was as likely to do it as anybody. I want to read you a couple of quotes from him now. Uh, this is from his, uh, his later work that, he, that was put together, as I say, from his writings after his death. He says, our investigation, meaning the philosophical investigation, is a grammatical one. Such an investigation sheds light on our problems by clearing misunderstandings away. Misunderstandings concerning the use of words caused, among other things, by certain analogies between the form of expression in different regions of, of language. He said, for instance, that philosophy can't really cross language barriers unless somebody's completely fluent in both languages, and that it's a translation process, because the words you use in different languages have different meanings. And you can't translate them just across, and so therefore doing, you, doing that in philosophy confuses the matter even worse. He continues, most of the propositions and questions of philosophers arise from our failure to understand the logic of our language. They belong to the same class as the question whether the good is more or less identical than the beautiful. Is the good identical to the beautiful? And his comment would be, that's a stupid question. There's no meaning to that. Good and beautiful are not scientifically measurable things. And so he would say that's not a reasonable question. He actually softened his views somewhat later on. but. Um, and he says, it is not surprising that the deepest problems are in fact not problems at all. That's not an issue. That that's, shouldn't be something we concern ourselves with. It's not really a problem. Continue. Language sets everyone the same traps. It is an immense network of easily accessible wrong turnings. And so we watch one man after another walking down the same paths, and we know in advance where he will branch off. Where, where walk straight on with, without noticing the side turning, etc., etc. What I have to do then is erect signposts at all the junctions where there are wrong turnings so as to help people pass the danger points. It is as we proceed with our language that we get confused. And he thought the job of philosophy, and he says I, because he thought he was the one satisfied, you know, meeting the needs of philosophy, to understand where people are going to start off in the wrong direction in terms of the meaning of words and help them understand how to stand on the right path. Um, so he believed that philosophy had, as the primary task, presenting a logic for how to understand our language theory. And as I say, whether you know his name or not, he has influenced every other field of philosophy, because every field of philosophy is to one extent or another now involved in the philosophy of language. Okay, now one of the things, even though um, Wittgenstein specifically wrote that he did not believe in scientism, that is, he didn't believe that science was the only source of understanding, that science was the only, the only reality you could understand was empirically, and that is scientifically. Still, people who did believe that took a lot of their, their beginnings from Wittgenstein. And I want to talk to you now about the logical positivists. Early 20th century, uh, a group of mathematicians, philosophers, scientists began to gather to talk about the writings of uh, the French philosopher Auguste Comte, David Hume, and Wittgenstein. After Wittgenstein uh, published his first tractus, they became known as the Vienna Circle. They were meeting in Vienna, which was a hotbed of intellectual pursuits back then. There's a reason why Freud was in Vienna, for instance. There was a lot of this sort of advanced thinking kind of stuff going on. Um, they proposed the philosophical system of logical positivism, primarily based upon David Hume and on Wittgenstein. And they insisted that the only meaningful statements were either those that were inherently true in the abstract, which means mathematics. You know, mathematics is an abstract form, but it is not based upon any, it's, it's a priori. You know, two plus two equals four. You don't have to have real apples to decide that's true. It is something that you do mentally. And so there is an inherent truth in certain abstract systems like mathematics. It's either that or it has to be scientifically verifiable. 
they presented what they called the verification principle, which was if you cannot prove empirically that a statement is true or false, then it is a nonsensical statement. Later on, they came up with the falsification principle, which they thought simplified it, it didn't really, which said that, it, that you should first focus to determine if something is true, determine whether it's false or not. Because it can be true 9,999 times, you know, in different, different aspects, but if you find just one thing, then, the, the 10,000th thing, that is false, then the whole thing is false. So they said, don't worry about what's true about it. Ask the question, is there anything false about it? If you can find just one falsehood, then it's not true. That's why they focused on what's false rather than true, the falsification principle. But they believed, logical positivists believed that their goal was, and I'm quoting here, the elimination of metaphysics through the logical analysis of language. And that once all metaphysical nonsense was done away with, they could then insist that people, I quote, confine themselves to verifiable scientific statements. Science and scientific verifiability, the verification principle, is the only way to know what's true or false, what's real or not real, what's good or not good. Even a good and not good would have been meaningless to that because you can't measure it. Now, there are no longer any living logical positives. <laughs> they, it, it, um, back in the probably 40s, it died out, well, it sort of morphed into something called logical empiricism because there was just too much indication from everybody that, that there's more to understanding and knowledge than something you can prove with a tape measure or a stopwatch, all right? They, they moved over into what's called logical empiricism. Less dogmatic, but still the same thing. And then that died out in the 1960s. There are no currently any philosophers or, or people who now maintain it, but in its day, Logical positivism had a huge influence. Um, Albert Einstein and Max Bohr, two great physicists, obviously, mathematicians and physicists, used to attend some of their events because they liked what they were saying. They didn't completely agree with them. They never really joined the club, but they felt like they had a lot going for them. They had some very bright people working in this field. And so there were a lot of people that they influenced, even people who would say, I don't really agree with you, but I sort of like the way you're thinking. That was the case of Einstein and Bohr. Um, the, there's an interesting statement, David Stover, a philosopher, he, he describes logical positivism as that justly famous episode of black comedy in the history of philosophy. Because everyone started saying, wait a minute, think of all the things in human life that you can't measure. Love, honor, trust faithfulness, you know, well, how many things can you identify that you cannot scientifically verify? You really don't think those things exist? And so the idea of calling it a, a period of black comedy in philosophy, there's obviously something else going on there. They went further than Wittgenstein because Wittgenstein would say that you need to focus primarily on the measurable stuff, but he recognized that anything you can use language about, and this is one of the ways he softened his statements later in his later works, anything that you can use language about has some Credibility. You know, if you, can, if you can use words on it, then there is something to it, whereas the positivists try to get rid of anything that wasn't scientific. Um, their influence can be seen especially in the modern preeminence on scientism, meaning science, and, and while we no longer, people no longer say they're logical positivists, they would no longer try to employ the principle of verification that you have to scientifically be able to prove it for it to be real we still sort of accepted the basic principle, and that is that science is the only valid source of reality. I say we, a lot of people in our culture. And this goes back, some of the logical positive stuff goes back to David Hume. Well, can you prove it? Right, remember that? Hume, in his, his introduction of skepticism, basically said, if you can't prove it, then how can you say it? The logical positivist picked that up and applied empiricism to it and said, if you can't measure it, how can you say it? And so they have influenced a lot of modern thinking, whether people have ever heard of the logical positivist or not. Um, their assumption that science is truth and reality and anything metaphysical or religious or, or ethical simply is incredible or even ridiculous. Um, the problem with that is that that has led a lot of people to moral ambiguity. If those things are meaningless, if it's nonsense to talk about ethics, then how can we have an ethic? 
things? How can we have morals? Dostoevsky, in, in Brothers Karamazov, he says something that applies directly to this, and that is, since they say that you can't talk about metaphysics, you can't talk about the supernatural, in effect, they are agreeing with some of the other philosophers that say, God is dead. You can't even talk about God. It's meaningless to even discuss God or the supernatural. Dostoevsky said that God is, if there is no God, then anything is permissible. Society has demonstrated, not consciously, but in terms of how they act, that that's true. People live that way. And that the logical positive has contributed to that. By saying, if you can't prove it, then there's, it's nonsense to even talk about it. You can't prove God, you can't talk about God, and you can't talk about ethics. Morality is not something you can measure per se. Then it leads us into the modern sort of disdain for moral absolutism of any kind. There's, there's a complete relativism in terms of um, people's moral perceptions. I'll, I'll quote David Hume, and this is one of the things that the logical positivists drew from Hume. That's why I've got errors that connect all these different people in the charts I do. Hume said, when we run to libraries persuaded of principles, what happens must we have? Hume said, if we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reason, reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No, then commit it to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. What happens when you begin to apply that unconsciously in a society? You get the early 21st century to a great extent. And all of these folks are contributing to that. Um, any questions about the logical positivists? Don't be sad. Yes. Yes. Beyond language. 
And that since language is, cannot be verified, it cannot be nailed down, you know, it's the indeterminacy. You talked about the, the um, metaphysics of presence. Is there something actually present in those words? And you'd say, no, they're just symbols. And he believed that there is no meaning available in language, there is no meaning that exists beyond language, and therefore meaning is not available. There is no such thing as real philosophical meaning. Stop looking. He therefore said there is no uh, trans transcendence. There is nothing beyond us. This is the construction. <coughs> now, Derrida's students, Carl Ratchie and others, Richard Rorty, Mark Taylor, uh, mostly Americans, have taken this and really amped up the nihilism in it. Nihilism meaning the hopelessness in it. And in fact, they have tended, Taylor, Richard Rorty, and, and uh, Ratchie, have tended to say, there is no meaning, it's all darkness, it's all desolation, and that's a good thing, because that at least is real. I'm sorry, but I don't think that's a good thing. Now, Derrida has argued that our belief in inherent transcendent meaning in the universe simply can't be proven, and so it has to be questioned. Now, I'm going to step back and take you back to David Hume. What did David Hume say? How do you know? David Hume said, just because every time in the past you have experienced a set of circumstances that this cause has resulted in the same effect, same cause, same effect, same cause, same effect, Hume said, you have no way of knowing that next time, you're only making an assumption, you're only guessing, that next time that cause is going to produce the same effect. If a billiard, you know, if a cue ball in the game of billiards strikes the object ball a certain way, and you've seen it strike that way 10,000 times, and the, the object ball has always responded the same way, you still have no logical proof or even justification for saying next time it's going to do the same thing again if it struck the same way. It could go straight up. It could drill down through the table. It could explode into a million pieces. You don't know. Derrida takes the same kind of assumption that Hume applied to physical reality and to our assumptions about physical reality and applies it to the nature of meaning. Just because we've always assumed that there was a connection between a word and the object we thought we were referring to in that word, and he would use other languages for instance, well they have a completely different word for that. How are we sure that our connection is the right one? How do we know that that meaning is real? And he would say we don't. We have no assurance that meaning exists at all, and therefore we have no assurance there is any such thing as meaning. Stop looking. He, he, the conclusion is that life is simply an uncertain place, it's meaningless, it's dark, get over it. You know, crank through. Put on your big girl panties and just live with it. Because there's not going to be any more Nothing more solid than that that you can stand on. Particularly, he said, since transcendence, the belief in something greater than us, outside us, above us, the transcendence is the basis for all philosophy and theology as well as all religious belief, all of those are to be discounted. There is no valid theology, there is no valid religious belief, there is no valid philosophy even. He killed philosophy. Remember I said that philosophers, you know, are like the character that said they love money and more prestige and power, and blowing stuff up. He blew everything up. And there was a period of time there when he was the dominant philosopher, starting right after 1966. 1966, Derrida presented a paper at John Hopkins University at a seminar there in semantics and, and, um, um, and symbolism. The Semantics is meaning symbol, that symbolism and signs that we use to represent things. His paper was called Structure, Sign, and Play in the Discourse of the Human Sciences. And it stopped everybody getting their tracks. And all of a sudden, he was the poster boy for postmodern philosophy, post structuralist philosophy. Structuralism is the philosophical idea that everything relates somehow, that there is some structure, that there is. Everything is a subset of something else, and so therefore there is a connection and there is meaning. Well, he says there is no connection. There is no meaning. It's post-structuralism, also post-modernism. We are sort of in the post-postmodern stage at this point. But 
His influence after that paper is and his writing, Derrida would make his own words up um, and then sort of defy people to really understand what he meant. His stuff is impossible to read. It's not that he uses big words, he uses words nobody else has ever, ever had. He made them up. And it's, it's so much of it sounds like a, it's just paradoxes. And all the way through, it is, other philosophers, major philosophers, has, have accused him of pseudo-philosophy or even sophism, you know, just saying things for the effect. Um, and yet, for all of that, Derek died in his life wrote more than 40 books, and he had, nobody can deny, whether they like it or not, that he's had a significant influence on all of the humanities and social sciences, most especially all of the sciences associated with, with writing. There are authors, novelists and others, who entirely see themselves as deconstructionist authors. That, that there, and whole schools of interpretation of literature that are now based upon deconstruction. He influenced literature, law, anthropology, historiography, linguistics, sociolinguistic, psychoanalysis, political theory, religious studies, feminism, and gay and lesbian studies. All of those have seen a direct effect of the work of Jacques Derrida, or Jackie, as I prefer to call it. Um, I'm not a huge admirer, in case you couldn't tell that. He, one of the reasons why he got heroes is because Derrida took his idea of looking for meaning that didn't really exist, and he just, he said one of the ways that that has happened in the sort of Western colonial cultures, in, and which is interesting, being a French Algerian, Algeria having been a colony of France for, you know, pretty much almost all of its modern history, the, he said that we, we create this meaning, and in doing so, we, um, we create these opposing dualisms. Good, bad, right, wrong, black, white, true, false. And he said, and we then overlay that onto culture and we use it as a way to oppress people. He made it a social issue. Black, white becomes the whites who are in power oppressing the blacks who are not in power. Those who are in power decide what is good and declare bad what others. And so he made this a social issue, which gave him some heat, you know, some following. Who doesn't like a new social strategy? And he believed that we had to do with all we had to do away with all of those dualisms, with all those senses that good is better than bad. Really. Because that's a dualism that he believes is artificially imposed, and in doing so, we actually use that to oppress people. So do away with any of those dualisms. There is no longer any difference between good and bad. They have to be seen as, as either as not separate things or as equal. Right? The consequences of that, I think, are pretty clear uh, when you start applying that to all the different areas that he has influenced. Um, Questions or about traditional assumptions about certainty, identity, truth, the meaning of important words in language, all of that got blown up. None of that from a deconstructionist philosophy point of view could be, could be talked about, even talked about anymore. Because a deconstructionist philosopher would say, you have no basis for discussing that. You're making assumptions about the meaning of those words, and you can't do that anymore. All right? Um, now, I've said how many different ways in which deconstruction has influenced culture, including, most visibly, architecture. All right? This is a deconstructionist or deconstructivism building. That's a real building. I see the architects in the group going, okay? The idea is all of the old rules about structure go out the window. Why should there be corners that are exact corners? Why should there be perpendicular planes in a building? Why, why not do that? Okay? There's another one, and there's a, there's a lot of views of this one. It's, it's called the Leaning Tower, and it's, it, it, it looks like somebody really messed up in designing it, like it's going to fall over, and that's entirely on purpose. This one, if you can see this, they have taken an old sort of American colonial kind of building, and they have broken it with this very modern angled, you always wonder what the floors are in those places. All right? Yes? Where are these buildings? Well, um, a couple of them I know. Some of them I just pulled pictures out of the Deconstructivist website, so I can't tell you exactly where they are. But this one, this is the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. 
Frank Gehry, who is a Seattle architect, who built the Bilbao Museum, in, uh, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. He's also built a couple of buildings in Seattle, which I'll show you in a couple in a minute. I'm from Seattle before being here. Um, and they, but if you go online and look at deconstructivist buildings, there are thousands of them around the world. Now, in fact, one of, the only one I really like is the, the public library in Seattle was built as a deconstructivist. But it's, it actually has planes and stuff. It's just a fascinating glass structure. Okay, and I really like it because it's very usable when you get inside. But this is, this is Bilbao, Spain. This is a bar in Spain. If you can see the various planes, it looks like they just suffered a really bad hurricane. <laughs> and it really tore the roof out. Yeah. Um, this one, which is a, a best store, you see here on the left, um, Yeah, here, this notch, and then they're very rugged, and it looks like there's rubble that are falling down here, like, you know, somebody bombed the place. That's on purpose. That's the way it's supposed to look. Because it's defying the usual expectations for what architecture means. Um, this one is also in Spain. You see the curve, and, and then these two, this is the EMP, or the Experience mu music, 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 music Project in Seattle, which was built by Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft. He loves science fiction, he loves music, he especially loved the music of Jimi Hendrix. And so he actually wanted to dedicate this museum to Jimi Hendrix, because he was a favorite of his. Jimi Hendrix is also from Seattle, that's his Paul Allen. And um, the, the family would not let him do it, and so he created this Experience Music Project, which is a great museum. Carolyn and I were, were uh, founding supporters of the EMP you know, when they first opened. And got great displays, you can go in there and they've got it set up, so even if you don't play guitar, they'll let you play guitar or drums, they have, you can sing, you can get a tape of yourself, you know, with a backup band. They've got museum displays of, of classic musical instruments and guitars, they have a, a stage there that they have great groups that come. It's a fascinating place, but it's, I should have just used one or two pictures. This is all different colored sheets of metal, and you can see the folds and things there. It looks like multicolored aluminum foil that has been wadded up and dropped right next to the space needle, because the space needle is right behind it. Okay? Um, there's, a, there's a tower right near there that is about the same height as the space needle, and it just looks like a black box. And people jokingly say, okay, that's the box that the spacing came in, and this is the wrapping paper that they took off of. <laughs> Deconstructionist, or de deconstructivist, because they changed the word slightly when we talk about architecture, the point is, defy all expectation of what architecture is supposed to be. Curved walls, you know, things that look like they're falling over. And uh, Frank Gehry, as I say, an architect out of Seattle, is probably the most famous now. He did the Bilbao Museum, he did the EMP project, the Experience Music project. Uh, but there are others that are doing that around the world. This is the extent of influence that Derrida and the deconstructionist movement has had on everything. You know, there are, you cannot be involved in English literature or literary criticism now, now without at least having to confront the influence that Derrida has had on uh, literature in modern times. Um, questions about that? How many of you have, had ever heard of Jacques Derrida before now? Or deconstructionism? Okay. And yet, if, you, if your kids are going into school in any area of study now, whether they're studying architecture or literature, languages, sociology, history, they're going to be fundamentally influenced by the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein that influenced the logical positivists, both of whom then influenced Derrida. Now, Derrida was also significantly influenced by Nietzsche and the whole nihilist movement, although he would deny that. If you ask him, his work reflects and even quotes quite a bit from those kinds of books. Nihilism is meaninglessness. There is no meaning. Well, that's what Derrida is saying because we have no way of connecting words with the thing the word is supposed to describe, then there is no meaning, meaninglessness rules. Get over it. Stop looking for it. Where do you think that takes us? 
We're going to talk about that next week. This chart, I've stopped drawing arrows. For one thing, it's gotten so you can barely see this stuff. The only arrow I've drawn on these bottom three, Wittgenstein, the logical positive of the Sendera dot, to some extent to all of this other background, you know, the, the influence of skepticism and of the question about, you know, materialism versus idealism, and developed a new approach in terms of language and meaning. The only arrow I've chosen, I've, read, I've drawn, is from Nietzsche to Derrida, because there's a very clear connection there. Otherwise, the arrows would be too complicated. They all have had influence on, on them. In fact, here, I've done this chart again, and I've added to it, see, I printed this out of black and white so I can't see it. The green ones, logical positivists would have to be enlisted under subjectivism and rationalism, because if you can't, you know, if you, you use your mind to determine what uh, reality is, and if you can't uh, determine it rationally, then it can't be real. You have to scientifically be able to prove it. Uh, logical positives, also scientists, very definitely. You know, science and empirical observation are the only sources of truth. Wittgenstein contributed to relativism. Truth is not absolute. It's what words you use and what, you know, what meaning they have. Um, the, all three of them added, oops, added to the idea of humanism. That truth is found in humans and science rather than revelation. The idea it's humans and the words they use and their understanding of meaning. Logical positives contributed to pragmatism. If it works, it must be right and true. In fact, they would say if it doesn't work scientifically, it can't be right and true. And then nihilism was definitely Derrida was part of that. This brings us, I mean, Derrida only died 12 years ago. And he was a major force in philosophy. And in, in, in that philosophy that influenced everything else. Next week, we are going to look at, so where do we go from here? How, now that you've experienced these lectures and have some sense, and you, you get, you're getting Ross Arnold's sense, because I'm the one that chose these philosophers. There are a lot of others. I could have brought in Schopenhauer or many other kinds of philosophers that would relate to the same things, but there's a limit to how much we can consume here. These are the ones I think most directly affect how we think in the Western world here early in the 21st century. Next week we're going to talk about, so what? Now that we have some understanding, where do we go with that? Do we just accept Derrida's comment that it is all dark, or Richard Rorty's, Rorty's or Carl Raschke, that, you know, that, uh, if you saw the quote I had on there, Raschke said that deconstruction is, is the dance of death on, on the grave of God, I think is what it was. That God has been killed, right? Um, do we accept that? Are we okay with that? Are we willing to say everything is darkness and we just have to go with it and if science is the only source of truth and there is nothing beyond that? What does that mean for things that, you know, if it has to be scientifically verifiable for it to be true, what do we do with things like love and honor and trust and friendship? You can't measure those things, can you? Not with a tape measure, not with a clock, you know, a stopwatch. Not with electrical microscope. So does that mean, you know, and these philosophers, some of the other ones would say, that means those things don't really exist. You're just making stuff up. Really? Are we willing to be okay with that? We're going to talk about that next week. Any questions about any of that? Yes, if you like. Most major cities have at least one main, one particular feature uh, building that is deconstruction in, in its in its abrupt yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that I well, that's a personal uh, appreciation point of view. I would imagine that this uh, Derrida was like a rebellious person. <laughs> it's yeah. it's a, like sort of shitty or or I don't know, like anti culture. Right. I wonder how maybe it sounds like us, but how is his personal life or what what was he rebelling at his what? Yeah, there's no indication that he had a particularly problematic personal life, like um, Nietzsche, who spent the last ten years of his life in the insane asylum. Um, Wittgenstein, he was the youngest of eight children. He had four brothers, three of them committed suicide. Um, and Der, uh, Wittgenstein, at various times in his life, was severely depressed and seriously considered suicide. Um, some of his close friends had to talk him down. 
And mostly they talked about by saying, you're too smart to, to kill yourself because you still got things to contribute and that he would accept because he really thought he was smart. He was smart. <laughs> Uh, but he was, nobody had more confidence in his brilliance than he did. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I, my sense of Derrida, and some of the pictures that you see of him, he's, he's sort of got this kind of sneaky smile on his face. I always felt like to some extent Derrida was um, sort of giggling at everybody else, you know, under his breath. That he was pulling one off, you know, pulling the wool over everybody's eyes, and nobody, nobody would declare that the emperor had no clothes. All right. Now some did. Yeah, there were actually were lawsuits. Uh, Cambridge University considered giving him an honorary degree, and some of the philosophy professors, James Searle particularly, they create practically were ready to go to war against the school that employed him. I mean, they had full tenure, so the school couldn't throw him out uh, to prevent. Cambridge from giving him an honorary degree because they thought the guy was was a fake. They called it pseudo philosophy, the sophistry, and they, they convinced Cambridge University that they should not give him a degree. And so there were a lot of people who basically said this guy is just full of it, and you guys are buying it. Well, some of that may be true, but whatever the case, when he was alive and working, his work has had massive influence in virtually every field of human endeavor in the last 30 years. If you don't believe that, again, look at the buildings. Um, and take a class in, you know, in literary criticism. And you may not, you may not focus on Derrida per se, but you'll focus on um, Foucault, who, is a, who much of his work was in the following year. Or others, like Mark Taylor, who are literary critics who are very much disciples of Derrida. So directly or indirectly, he influences every, all of those areas of study. History is being reinterpreted based upon the deconstructionist kind of model. So you think history, you know, how's that? Well, if there is no meaning, then how do you interpret history? Thanks for coming, everyone. We'll be back next